Without further ado, I will pass it on. Our presentation this afternoon is Supporting Open Education in Promotion and Tenure, a Toolkit for Instructors and Institutions. Our three presenters are Abby Elder from Iowa State University, Mariah Burnett from the University of Iowa, and Terry Cope from Drake University in Des Moines. And with that, I will pass it on to the presenters. Thank you. Okay, so thank you. C can you see the screen? I hate to ask, but can you see? Okay, yes. good. Okay. Um, should we go ahead and I guess Kevin introduced us already. So we, we probably could skip that part. Um, thank you, Kevin. So I'll get go ahead and get right into it. Um, why are we having this discussion today? So people have become increasingly aware that we must professionally recognize the level of work involved for those working with OER. So in March, 2019 report titled, A Place for Policy, the Role of Policy in Supporting Open Educational Resources and Practices at Ontario's Colleges and Universities by James Skidmore and Murdo Pravida, they said, the, the largest barrier to participation in open educational practices, OEP, is a lack of professional recognition. So that's the main reason. Um, promotion and tenure requirements vary by institution, but almost all include some variation of research or scholarship, teaching and service. So are OER related activities considered scholarly? Do they count for promotion and tenure? Our discussion today focuses on the way OER related work does fit into the categories of research, teaching, and service, an evidence that you or those you support can provide to support the case. So that leads us to the OEPT Toolkit. What is it? The Open Education and Promotion and Tenure Toolkit is a place to start when looking for materials to support yourself or others and advocating for including open educational practices in promotion and tenure discussions at your institution. Specifically, it is a set of supplementary materials, which Abby will discuss in greater detail, handouts for advocacy and self-advocacy, open educational practices for P&T presentation, which is slides, and getting OER into P&T documents. So next, Mariah will talk about how we did it. All right, thank you, Terry. So this project was part of a four person subcommittee of the Iowa OER action team and it included Abby Terry and I as well as Anne Marie Gruber from the University of Northern Iowa. And as Terry kind of already mentioned, we decided to pursue this project because the question of open education practices and promotion and tenure comes up a lot at various institutions, including our own. And so individual instructors need guidance for how to prepare their own portfolio and how to include OEP activities in their own case for tenure. But then those who support programs, um, administrators, librarians, educational technologists, others who support OEP, also need to be able to advocate for inclusion of OEP and promotion and tenure at the institution level. So to prepare um, for this project, we reviewed the existing literature and we looked at institutions that were kind of already counting open education practices in promotion and tenure. We also sort of looked at measuring the impact of OEP generally. And we have found um, in the process of our research that several institutions have policies um, for how to count OER in the promotion and tenure process. So we relied heavily on those. And we also um, relied heavily on the Doers 3 project and the Doers 3 matrix, um, which really helped us align the individual OEP practices with the categories of P&T. So at the same time that we were conducting the literature review, we also identified stakeholders that um, at our home campuses that might also you know, have applicability at other campuses as well. Um, and how they might be able to help us in kind of some specific talking points and information that we can provide with those individual stakeholders. So um, in order to actually kind of call all this information together and turn it into a final project, we, um, we conducted several working meetings where we gathered our research, we planned the structure of the document and we wrote the main document kind of all together. And then we shared that manuscript with our whole Iowa OER action team and we received some feedback on it. We discussed it at a whole committee meeting, and then um, Abby was able to turn our Google Doc into the version that you see on PubHub, which includes um, 
you know, some nice graphics and very nice typesetting and then our supplemental handouts as well. So we'll look at that all in just a few minutes. Next slide, please. There we go. So now I'm going to kind of give a brief overview of the main document that exists as part of the toolkit. And I'm just kind of going to give a brief tour of it and then turn it over to Abby to talk about the supplemental materials. But the purpose of the main document is really to provide kind of a narrative description of how OEP aligns with promotion and tenure. And it's meant to be written at a level that it's not very dense. You know, we, we include a lot of charts and bullet points and things like that. And it's meant to appeal to OEP practitioners, as we mentioned, who are hoping to include this work in their own promotion and tenure case, as well as administrators and others at institutions. And the document covers kind of the four main areas you see on the screen here. So we begin by talking about OER and OEP generally, and we kind of align it conceptually with the idea of promotion and tenure. And then we move on to talk with more specificity about advocating for the inclusion of OEP in the promotion and tenure process in the three categories of teaching, research, and service. And then finally, we outline some specific talking points and identify particular stakeholders that may be common across campuses. And, um, and then finally, our appendix, um, it was based off the Dewar's Three Matrix, and it, it maps out particular OEP activities by the three categories of promotion and tenure. So now I'm going to just dig a little deeper into those four kind of sections of the document. The first is the framing. So um, we really begin with defining OER and OEP. And so I included kind of the four activities on the screen here that really comprise OEP. Uh, the first is the adoption and use of open educational resources. You know, this is kind of the main activity or what a lot of people consider to be the main activity of OEP. And it's really often sort of aligned with traditional teaching practices. But then we have things like the adaptation and creation of OER um, to meet a course's needs. Um, this is often much more time intensive, this work, and is sometimes supported by grant funding or departmental funding or other sorts of institutional or regional support. Uh, the third activity is the use of open pedagogy or other innovative teaching methods that incorporate OER into the instruction of learners. So this would be things like involving students in the creation of an OER, having them be involved in the editing of an OER or some other authentic assessment that would really sort of center the OER and allow students to participate in a meaningful way. And the final is the study of OER and its impact on learners. So this is really looking at sort of the scholarship of teaching and learning. Oftentimes this will be an activity that counts towards research at some institutions. So after we um, sort of introduce the idea, we move on to um, more of an explication of how OEP can meet the three requirements, right? The three categories of teaching, research, and service. So this is again, sort of more of a narrative section. We emphasize um, the case that um, some of these practices should indeed count for research, especially since that is sort of, in many cases, the most important category for, um, for, for professors working, working in this space. Um, we also call out some specific examples of existing policies that, um, that that particularly mention OER and how it should be counted to P&T. And so that can be very helpful if you're thinking about moving in that direction at your own institution. Um, these can be great things to share with administrators. Next slide, please. And then the third section, we move on to talking points and stakeholders. So this is where I mentioned earlier, we tried to identify some stakeholders that were common across many different campuses. And we, we laid this out in sort of a table so that you can easily identify various stakeholders, what kind of things they can help you with, and when you might want to contact them. So you can see, for example, like with the provost, you might want to contact them when you have some data, because that, that is often very resonant for, for provosts. Then we follow up our chart with a few tips on actually talking with stakeholders. Um, the one I included as an example on the screen here is demonstrating how OER work aligns with an institution's strategic plan. So we all know that that's often a way to really advocate for getting things done, is to align your goals with those of the institution. And then finally, we include our appendix, which was based on the Dewar's Three Matrix that you see on the screen here. I think MJ Bishop talked about it a bit in her keynote uh, earlier today, but it comes from um, this document, OER and Tenure and Promotion. And it, it comes from the Dewar's Three team. And it essentially calls out various activities that you might participate in under, under open educational practices. 
and then what evidence you might want to present for the case to be made in, in all of the three categories. So this example on the screen here is just a really small kind of excerpt of the table under research. So the first activity published a peer reviewed open textbook or other OER. So that's you know an activity that somebody might do. The evidence to present as to how that should count towards research would be documentation of the peer review process, right? So, you know, you could solicit peer reviews, keep um, keep you know the reviews themselves as part of your portfolio, and you know you could you can make the case potentially that way for it to count towards towards research. We also have that final column that um, sort of tells you know, OER practitioners that, you know, if, if it doesn't count towards this category of research, it may also count towards other categories. And so in this instance, um, it may also fall under teaching. So that's kind of the main document in a nutshell. I'm going to turn it over now to Abby, who will talk about the supplementary materials. Alrighty, thank you, Mariah. So as Terry mentioned earlier, in addition to our main document that our team created, we wanted to provide something tangible to help people coming to the toolkit who might be overwhelmed by the amount of content presented up front. Uh, so in addition to that overarching document, we also created some supplementary materials housed on the site, including two handouts and a page titled Getting OER into Tenure and Promotion. The handouts are intended to work as an introduction to the topics presented in our main document, sort of in a truncated fashion, with two different focuses. One handout is for advocates. Back up one, Terry. There you go. Uh, one handout is for advocates and provides an overview of the sections in our adapted promotion and tenure matrix, as well as a truncated set of tips for talking to stakeholders. Uh, and one handout is intended for self-advocacy and provides examples of how to frame open educational practices in a way that clearly showcases their ties to research, teaching, and service, and tips for getting in touch with local support, like the Iowa OER Action Team or institutional committees that support faculty doing OER work. The final document is a little bit different, though. As Mariah mentioned earlier, when we were putting together the introductory sections of our work, we wanted to pull together some examples of how other institutions have handled including OER and tenure and promotion work before us. Uh, so this document, Getting OER into Tenure and Promotion, is sort of our working doc that includes not just OER, but also examples of how open access, scholarship of teaching and learning, and other practices that relate to openness or instructional innovation might be worked into existing tenure guidelines. Uh, while this was sort of a working document for us, it made sense for us to also include it in our supplementary documents, since it might be useful to other people coming into this after us. If you've already seen our site, you might be thinking, wait, there are other things that are included in the supplementary materials, and you'd be right. Uh, we also have a set of slides for presenting to stakeholders, which was contributed by Kristen Whitman, an OER professional at I Idaho State University, not Iowa State, uh, where she found our toolkit and asked if we might be interested in developing or sharing a set of slides. Uh, these slides are a basic framework for talking to administrators in favor of adding OEP into promotion and promotion and tenure guidelines, uh, and can be adapted for your context and needs. I bring up Kristen's contribution separately, uh, in part because she deserves kudos, but also because you can contribute too. Uh, the site we chose for using and creating and sharing the toolkit is PubPub, which is an open and free to use service for sharing documents and collaborating with peers, and it's got some great functionality for collaboration. Uh, specifically, if you want to get involved, you can review and comment on our existing documents within a PubPub account, which is free, uh, collaborate with us to share your own resources, or just share the site with peers who you think might be interested in using these materials themselves. If you want to work together on something like Kristen's Advocacy Slideshow, you can reach out to me personally and we can get in touch on how to do that. Now, this is usually where I'd end a presentation after that, and now get in touch with us sort of bit. Uh, but I also want to talk a bit about how you can use the toolkit. <clears throat> so there are two basic ways that most people are going to use the OEPT toolkit, and it's with that main document. First, you might use the matrix in that main document to help you sort out what type of work falls under certain categories for tenure and promotion guidelines. Just the simple, basic way of approaching this work. Or you might look at your institution's existing PT materials to find pathways where OEP fits best in your context. If you can't actually make a case or get in touch with people to make change to the guidelines in place at your institution, it can often be most helpful to just make the things that are already the guidelines and find ways to fit OEP into the, that. So like we said before, fitting the OEP into research, into teaching, into service. And second, who do you do this work for? Uh, so it's not just 
how you use the materials for yourself, but how you use them might depend on who you're using them for. Uh, so if you're using these for others, for advocating for faculty on your campus, you might talk with those practitioners about their work and help them connect the dots between the work they're doing and their traditional PT requirements. If you're doing this for yourself, you might want to make the case for how your contributions count toward your tenure and promotion. <laughs> And if you're wanting to help us, which I appreciate, uh, you can also provide feedback on that PubPub site and help us contribute to the continued growth of our documents. So if you want to check out our site, it's at oept.pubpub.org, nice and simple. Uh, and we'll move on now to questions and sort of exploring what you want to learn more about. I, I have a question. Um, and I, it's, this is a question maybe without an answer, but um, in your research that you did with work at other institutions and at your own institution where you, you've talked about this, when people express reservations about including open educational work and promotion and tenure, do you, uh, does it seem like it comes more often from administrators or from faculty? Personally, uh, a lot of the time when I hear from people that they're hesitant or concerned about it, it's more often from faculty uh, because they're concerned about past experiences they've had and whether this is going to repeat those concerns. Say someone wrote a textbook in the past and that didn't count for their pro promotion and tenure. Now they're making an open textbook and they think, well, now it really won't count, even though for example, our open textbooks here at Iowa State do go through a formal peer review process a lot of the time, so it might be more accurate to be included than a traditional one that doesn't go through those processes. And the other, another thing is, you know, um, from the last presentation, one of the last presentations, um, Rebecca Funke was talking about how open educational stuff includes much more than just textbooks, of course, they could be assignments, they could be data sets, they could be a variety of things. Um, and I guess the question is, do you, in trying to do open educational practices into promotion and tenure, again, in the research that you've done and your own personal experiences, is it the kind of the, I did the publication, whether it's a textbook or a book or something that seemed to fit, what about other stuff like data sets and assignments and so forth? Is that has there been work on including that stuff into promotion and tenure as well? I think you could include work with those types of materials into the kind of four categories we highlighted. So, I mean, if you're just using those materials kind of as is and maybe incorporating them into your class, maybe you're still using a traditional textbook, um, you know, you could potentially count that as adoption. Although, you know, since you're not maybe using it as your main book, you might have a harder time making that case. But if you're tailoring resources, you know, to the needs of your course and really doing a lot of adaptation and remixing, um, you know, that could potentially count towards teaching as well. Yeah, there's a lot of different ways you can include that sort of work. And it's the same as with any open access materials you might be creating. Open data generally is something that may or may not be included in promotion and tenure guidelines, depending on how your institution feels about it and how the overall landscape is. Uh, so it's more about finding ways to make the case for yourself and seeing where things fit already, uh, rather than thinking about, well, I have to include OER that are data and OER that are syllabi and that all are all of these individual things. It might be more accurate to say, think about what it is you're doing, and then based on what it is you've done, how does that fit into these guidelines that are arbitrarily or not so arbitrarily set by your institution? Thank you. The chat's a little quiet, but you can be certain to uh, post anything there if you have questions as well. We sort of ran through the slides quickly because we do want to make sure there's plenty of time. If anyone wants us to go out and look at something in the documents, if you'd like to explore something more in depth, feel free to reach out and let us know. We got plenty of time.
Well, I'll go again. I, I shouldn't uh, monopolize here, but in in the documentation, you had a, and now I won't come up with the slide, but it had a uh, kind of a set of points if you were making your own case as opposed to going to trying to make your case to an administrator or something. Was that was that correct? Yes. Yeah. Could you could you show that? <laughs> Actually, let me... Uh, are, are you able to show that? Yes. So one of the things that we created, and I can screen two, correct? Yeah. So one of the things we created was our handout for self-advocacy, uh, okay. which is about aligning your work to the expectations of your institution. Uh, and a couple of the things we included here are quotes uh, that might include how you would talk about this type of work. So saying you're contributing to the body of work available in this field, uh, creating high quality educational materials, uh, supporting student success, uh, publishing or presenting on the outcomes of your teaching. So this might be service if you're going to conferences and talking about your work in OEP. Uh, just really thinking about how you're addressing the work that you're doing, not just saying, I do OER work, but saying, I'm doing impactful work that is related to student success and affordability on campus. And we've got that in our handouts here on the website, along with our other supplementary materials. But I can leave this up in case anyone else wants to explore something we've got on the website itself. Our open educational OEP um, work, is it included in promotion and tenure at uh, Iowa State, Iowa, or and or Drake? Not expressly. Yeah, same, not expressly at our institution. It's sort of a department by department basis. No, I mean, you know, it's certainly not expressly, and I'm not even sure, you know, even in a roundabout way. So need to take a look at some of the promotion and tenure requirements for the different departments and see if there might be, a, you know, some of the language that Abby was talking about as a potential way in to begin matching some of this, the type of work that they may be doing with what may already be the existing requirements. So I kind of have to start taking a look at that. Mm -hmm. Leslie? At Drake, in the College of Health, uh, Pharmacy and Health Sciences, it's, it's not expensive expressly uh, written in, but it is considered as part of the process. And it generally is considered as part of scholarship and or as service, depending on how the individual faculty member um, represents it in their dossier. That, that's good to know, Leslie. So have, have you seen that where some of the faculties have actually done some of this work and then gotten credit, credit for it? Yeah, in I, just, I, just, I just did it in the fall. <laughs> So Congratulations. That's yeah, now that's good. I'd love to talk to you about more about it later. Yeah, absolutely, Terry. Would love to talk okay, to you about that. Great, great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll say for Iowa State University specifically, uh, one of our big things we did a few years ago was uh, expressly acknowledging uh, SOTL or Scholarship of Teaching and Learning in our tenure and promotion guidelines. Uh, so if faculty members were, say, doing research about the impact of OER in their coursework, uh, then that would count as a SOTL outcome for research and teaching. So maybe we can ask if any of the participants have any experiences with um, OER and their PNT processes that they'd be willing to share. Yeah, good, bad, and uh, expected. <laughs> um, actually, I will. I will contribute. So at Mount Mercy, we don't necessarily have it officially, but that's part of the reason why I'm on online right now is to kind of hear what other people are doing. I know that we have a few faculty that are there. And so I think the biggest thing that I always hear from my own colleagues is 
from the traditional standpoint, how do you define OER where there's that review process? And, mm -hmm. and so like defining that to make it separate from like what a blog might look like or what, like, for example, if you were to publish your own book through Amazon, that's not going to be necessarily vetted. And so I think those are the kind of, kind of considerations that I'm intrigued by through this session to hear, like, what do you accept as a proper evaluation process? Because that would be something that I anticipate my colleagues would be asking for in order to make it officially considered research or scholarship accounted for a promotion and tenure process. I would say it would just be really important to document any peer review that happens with these textbooks. And I think the process is a little bit different than it would be for something like, um, you know, a commercial textbook or even for a peer reviewed article, you know, because a lot of times with OER, the peer review will be done um, sometimes even after publication, you know, like it will be uploaded into a repository and then it will receive reviews kind of after the fact. And so, you know, just being able to document all of that and, you know, try to align it to the practices of your discipline or to your institution. Yeah, and I'll follow up on that just to say one of the reasons why traditionally textbooks might not be included in uh, PNT is because they don't usually go through a peer review process. So OER is sort of unique in that way because they do have the option of going through that more robust review, uh, whether it is a set of videos or a set of slides or a set of homework software, whatever it might be, uh, or a textbook. So I think more than anything else, it would say, you know, high quality OER that have gone through a, a review process uh, fitting with the other guidelines included in X documentation. Uh, just including that and then having some set standards to follow would help uh, because without a little bit of leeway, you're going to be excluding a lot of content that might otherwise be impactful and worth including in those documents. And you don't want to say only open textbooks count if there's a lot of other things that faculty are doing that are worth acknowledging in this work. And just logistically too, with, with OER and peer review, um, it's something that sometimes authors kind of have to seek out on their own. Like some of the authors in our program will post their manuscript on something like Rebus Community and ask for feedback to that platform, or they may know some people just through their professional networks that are familiar with OER and familiar with the discipline that can they can send manuscripts off to. So in some cases, it can be more of an author-directed sort of process than it would normally be with other types of publication. Chris. You're currently muted, Chris. Thank you, Ivy. Um, is there anyone who has um, worked to incorporate um, data on the uptake of an open educational research by others in terms of making a PNT case? I don't know if it's officially gone through uh, promotion and tenure yet, I would have to ask, uh, but we do have an open textbook that is shared in the institutional repository here at Iowa State, uh, where the instructors had a lot of downloads and a lot of data about the use of the book that he's used in his uh, discussions with faculty at, at, in his department about why it's been so impactful and how it's made an impact uh, around the state specifically, in part because the download stats show uh, that faculty at Drake are using his book. So we can say, oh, look, faculty at Drake and at DMAC are using my book. And I can see that from these statistics and see that other institutions are incorporating it. Uh, but besides that, the other big one would be the open textbook library reviews, uh, which shows, for example, if a faculty member has reviewed a book uh, what they rated it and how they went through that review process. And it'll also say, say this is a senior lecturer at the University of Wisconsin. So currently, is there um, any, any structure established um, uh, through OER sites to help authors track whether anyone else has adopted it for a course? 
Yes, it depends in part on where you publish it. Uh, so again, if you publish something uh, yourself and you're just putting it out on a website, then some people will put together a form saying, if you're using my book, let me know. Uh, if you're posting it on the open textbook library, you'll get reviews like this one from people who have either used or just reviewed the content. Uh, really, it depends on where you're putting it out. And that's the same with all things. You're not going to know where your book is being purchased if you've uh, published a book a lot of the time, unless you go look it up on a bunch of libraries' websites. Thanks. I'll just mention I'll just mention uh, some experience at Grinnell from being on personnel committees and things. Um, of course, this doesn't have to be open educational, but materials, published materials that involve the work of students really seem to uh, catch people's eye. And so it, it, of course, it doesn't have to be an, an OEP kind of thing, but mentioning that, yes, I involved my students in doing this and we put it out, that really seems to count no matter what it is. So that's another way to work this in, at least here. And at Grinnell, there's no explicit thing like many places about whether it's OEP or not. But um, I know certainly incorporating things by working with your students. And the other thing in the sciences, being on a personnel committee, uh, uh, what's the word I want? Uh, making things, making data available publicly is another thing in the sciences, at least at Grinnell, that, that gives you some stars. Yeah, open data, open science, team-based learning, project-based learning. Once you learn all the lingo, then it makes it a lot easier to <laughs> bring things up in the way that people like to hear about it. Yeah. I'll, I'll just ask, ask a question broadly. I know Abby had mentioned this and mentioned about Mount Mercy. Are there other institutions out there that already have OEP stuff explicitly in promotion and tenure materials at your institution? And there's a question from Norma too in the chat. Yeah. So one of the things we did in our uh, overview of getting OER into promotion and tenure documents uh, was looking at all the ways that this has or has not already been done. Uh, so specifically uh, how it's talked about, why it's needed, and then uh, if it's already in TMP documents, how so. Uh, so we've got quotes pulled out from how people are talking about this at Grand Valley State, British Columbia, UMass Amherst, Miami University. Some of these are only for some departments. So it's the TCPL faculty uh, that's specific teaching and other things faculty. I don't know all their departments, uh, but then other things that may pertain to OER, but aren't necessarily explicitly. So scholarship of teaching and learning, uh, open access materials, uh, textbooks and textbook chapters, because it can still be an open textbook and count if you count textbooks. Uh, and so on and so forth. So thinking about, there are other ways that we can say open access scholarship could also include OER, for example. But you can look through that if any of you are interested. I'm gonna get to the top of this page very quickly because I know the scrolling can be a little bit much for people. <laughs> And it could just be that only some departments, uh, seeing that note in the chat, some departments are noting it explicitly, whereas others, it's either on a case-by-case -case basis or they haven't taken the time to include it or change their documents in however many years. Not being included doesn't necessarily mean that it's not counted, it's just that they haven't taken the time to look into it, yeah.
Yes, a question from Mariah and Terry. Are either of you have any plans or anyone else, do you have any plans for how you'd like to go forward moving the, a toolkit like this or this toolkit specifically uh, in your own advocacy work? Well, I'd really like to sort of hand out the toolkit to all of the people in our grants program who are completing their OER projects. Um, we don't ever, I mean, we don't, we haven't yet really in our program explicitly talked about the case for promotion and tenure as a cohort. And so I think, you know, providing this information to our faculty to help make their own case is probably my next priority. That, that seems like a great idea because because we are also working with some of the gear grant people and we have a separate group too that we're working with faculty from different subject areas. And, you know, this did come up in one of our discussions. So definitely want to get this in everybody's hands, this toolkit. And then I think also just try to begin to have some of the discussions with some of the, the faculty in the different colleges, starting maybe with Leslie, since she's already obviously been successful in that regard. And I, and I would like to see, you know, what the requirements are and how she was able to incorporate that in, in, you know, in their requirements for um, CPHS, College of um, Pharmacy and Health Sciences. And then maybe look at some of the other colleges too and just see what it looks like maybe see, just ask if, if people have thought about this, because even when I had a discussion with some faculty, I think a lot of times people feel like it's, you know, this is something that they're doing because, you know, they're good people and they want to, they just want to be good people. But I don't think always everybody thinks that this could count for PNT. And, you know, that, that was a little bit surprising that, that that might even be a possibility. So I think just generally getting the word out Uh, Chris has a raised hand. It might be an old raised hand. Oh, an old raised hand. Okay, I'm sorry. Leslie. If I could just respond to what Terry was saying. Um, one of the things I'm realizing, at least at Drake, is that there are differences in the PNT requirements across the university in general, let alone whether or not they look at the use of OER within their, their processes. So, so that might be an area that, that may need to have some discussion in terms of how do we make some of these requirements or expectations cons consistent across the university? And then where does OER fit in all of that? That's interesting, and I know, and I know there's some um, some of the smaller colleges have just a general, I think, university promotion and tenure committee for the for their college or for their university, and it's and it's the same, you know, the same committee, I guess, or same requirements across their college. Certainly, that's not the case at Drake, and probably not the case at some of the larger regions as well. Um, so, yeah, in, in those cases, especially where there are different requirements or different colleges or different units definitely have to, to take a look at that. For, for those of you that have um, sort of one PNT committee for your college, maybe that potentially would be a less daunting prospect. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm curious to know what everybody's thoughts would be about that. If any. <laughs> I didn't want to speak up again so soon, uh, but I think that's a great point about Terry and Leslie about thinking about how you can make something more standardized. But at the same time, there are so many disciplinary differences and why things are approached differently. Uh, you don't want to say, oh, all you people in history only write articles and not books or that sort of thing. Uh, but there are, also, there are also general guidelines that are the underpinning of uh, the most of the tenure and promotion guidelines that people go off of, and then they're tweaked for departmental use, at least in my experience. So maybe there would be a place to say, like syllabus statements and syllabi, which we all love and appreciate, <laughs> adding in some standard language for OER or other types of uh, open work as well.
Any other questions? We're getting toward the end of our time here. We can all take a break before the last session. Well, thank you all for attending and thank you, Abby and Mariah and Terry. And there'll be another session at three o'clock. So thank you all and have a good afternoon.